All right, everybody, welcome back to another flipped lesson here. And in this lesson, uh, you have myself and Mr. Leonard. I don't know if you guys can hear him. Say hi, Mr. Leonard. What's up, guys? Uh, so in this video, uh, we're going to talk about how organisms evolve. So this chapter already in evolution, we've really done a lot of defining what evolution is. We've talked about natural selection. Um, and now we're going to kind of look at the specifics of the, the bigger picture of how that actually works. So make sure you follow along. Fill in the blanks in your notes there, and uh, if you have questions, go back and watch the video if you missed anything, uh, or shoot your teacher an email. So here we go. All right. Uh, Mr. Leonard, why don't you take this off here and get us started? Sounds good. Uh, as has been brought up in class, or, 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 or I'm sure has been mentioned in your classes, that evolution is a phenomenon felt at the population level. What's a population? Uh, it's a group of the similar... It's a group of similar organisms, same species that live together in a fine area. So the environment is going to be the same and their natural selection will act on that group in a similar way. But as we have learned, populations of individuals, not every individual is the same, right? There's, there's variation. And that variation uh, can be looked at all the way down at the genetic level, right? And we you guys know from your genetics lessons about different alleles and the different allele combinations give us different phenotypes. And so it's the different phenotypes that get acted upon by natural selection. So we have to start to shift our focus and thinking just a little bit in terms of what Darwin tried to explain to us is actually the result of subtle changes at the gene level. And so how that plays out is going to be, you know, dependent on what those genes code for phenotypically, and then the environment selects for certain phenotypes over others. But we have to start thinking about, thinking about this at, at a genetic level as well. And there's actually a term for this. We call this population genetics. Exactly. And, and important to remember, too, that that's inherited, right? So it's passed from parent to offspring, and that's how we could see those populations change over time. It's not just affecting one individual. So as Mr. Leonard said, right, our population genetics. So the evolution from the perspective of genes, and way back at the beginning of the year or halfway through the year, we, we've talked about genes and genetic and, uh, you know, our boy Gregor Mendel and figuring all that stuff out. So how do those genes influence evolution, right, through inheritable traits or heritable traits? All right, so that population genetics depends on the frequency, distribution, and inheritance of alleles in a population. So uh, just a little refresher here, right? Our alleles, okay, are the forms of a gene that we may see. And um, you can see here, I guess these are pigs, right, right, Mr. Leonard? Uh, yeah, they look like wild boars, maybe. Wild boar, yeah. So, right, a gene, if we're thinking about simple Mendelian genetics, has two alleles, and we represent an allele by a letter. So... You could be homozygous dominant. You could be homozygous recessive. You could be heterozygous, okay? So when we're looking at population genetics, it has to do with all the alleles in the entire population. So all these wild boars, right, that live in that certain area, that population, um, th those alleles are going to influence, right? It's not just one individual or two individuals, okay? And you've probably heard this term before called the gene pool. Uh, and that's what we're referring to. It's the sum of all the genes or alleles in a population. Uh, so again, and, and it looks like we got some brown ones here, some uh, like white and black ones here, the heterozygous, and then some some white ones would be the homozygous recessive. So you add up all those genes in a population, and you'll see different amounts, right, based on the phenotypes that you see. But all those genes added up equal the gene pool, and how that gene pool is compromised of different alleles is going to affect which way evolution might go uh, in the future based on those environmental pressures. So when we think about that picture on the previous slide of a gene pool, and, that, and I, I would challenge you guys to all start thinking about a population, maybe not in terms of the individuals that you see, but in terms of the collection of their alleles, and that's when this starts to make more sense. So what actually changes a population over time? Well, it's what we call a change in the allele frequency, which is how 
what proportion of the gene pool is made up by a certain type of allele. And so like using the last example on the previous slide, big B, little b for the boar hair color, um, two alleles for that particular trait. And when we look at gene pools for these types of studies, we tend to focus on one trait and we look at how many alleles for that one trait and what is the frequency. If you were to, if every individual, let's say hypothetically in a population was heterozygous, what would the allele frequency be of the dominant allele? It would be 50%, right? If every individual has one big allele, one dominant allele, and one recessive allele, and that's every individual, no matter how many you have, 10 or 100 individuals in that population, but they each have one of each type, you do the math, right? The whole population has half of them big Bs, half of them little Bs. So that would be a 50% um, allele frequency. Now that could definitely change because not every individual is going to be heterozygous in a population. You'll have some that are homozygous dominant, some that are homozygous recessive, and some that are heterozygous. And so there's a slight little bit of math and some calculations that you might have to make from time to time when uh, calculating allele frequency. But it's really, think of a pie chart, right? And that pie chart represents all of the alleles of that type. And you're really just figuring out what percentage of each allele is made. And so what happens is over time, allele frequencies may change because what does that allele actually code for? Well, it codes for a particular phenotype. Maybe it's, you know, a lighter color that helps you blend in better to your surroundings. Think of the peppered moth uh, example from earlier. Well, because that might confer an advantage, those alleles are going to survive longer and then be passed on more frequently, thus increasing the frequency of the light colored allele. So over time, we see more individuals with the light color uh, phenotype, but realistically what's happening is more of the light colored alleles were, were being passed on to future generations. And so that's, that's one of the ways that we, we measure evolutionary change. It, it, it's something that we can look at, especially with modern technology and, and DNA technology. We can really have a lot of good example, concrete evidence of this happening. Cool. All right. So, um, you know, moving on from that allele frequency and really looking at the, the genetic level and how a population is going to go, um, you know, we can talk about it according to population genetics. So evolution is nothing more or less than a change in the genetic population over multiple generations. And this kind of goes to what Mr. Leonard just said, right? Uh, and what we've talked about in the past couple of weeks is that we're not going to see, you know, evolution of and speciation in one generation, right? It takes time to pass these traits down. And as we go a little bit further in this lesson, um, just like Mr. Leonard described, right, you'll have maybe a wide population, but due to selective pressures, only certain alleles are going to have uh, an advantage, right, and have higher fitness, and those organisms will survive more. So again, it's really the genetic makeup um, of these populations being passed down. And so there's a way to describe this, uh, which two guys here, they're, they're pretty cool. The Hardy-Weinberg principle, and Mr. Leonard's going to gonna give us a little lowdown on the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So <clears throat> if this was a AP class, in biology, you all would be expected to take these equations, understand them, and have to do and use them. Now, thankfully, um, this is not an AP class, and so it is in the standards that we will not have to do these calculations for MCAS or any of that. But I still want to just introduce and show you what these equations are, and just just talk about what the premise of this. So we had this team of scientists. Um, that worked out a, a model, it's a mathematical model that illustrates what it would take for a population to remain in what we call genetic equilibrium. All right, so I want you to think back to a couple seconds ago when we were talking about allele frequencies, right? So how do we know if a population is evolving? It's when the allele frequencies change, you know, over multiple generations. But what if they don't change? What if the allele frequencies stay static? And they stay the same, right? Generation after generation after generation. 
That means no evolution is occurring. Therefore, we're in what we call genetic equilibrium. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle, and what we won't get into the math of it, but you know the P's and the Q's represent uh, the you know two types of alleles of a diploid organism for any given trait. And what it what it allows us to show is whether or not a population is evolving or not. Quite frankly, um, so without getting into the specifics of the the math about it, we just want to kind of talk about the principle as kind of an overarching view of here are all the the um, and there's there's five like standards, there's five kind of points of of of, of importance that we look at to determine okay. If, if all of these five things are true and all five would have to be true. Now, this is hypothetical, mind you, right? Most natural populations are not in genetic equilibrium. Therefore, they are evolving. But to understand this concept, we have to kind of flip it and think of it from a perspective of what would it take for a population to not experience changes in allele frequency? So therefore, to, to not evolve, right? Even though this might not be the way it actually works, we have to identify all of those conditions. So there are five conditions, right, that the Hardy, Hardy and Weinberg came up with as to, all right, if none of these things happen, or all, if all these things are true, a population will remain in genetic equilibrium. So what would it take for a population to not evolve and remain in equilibrium? There must be no random mutations. There would have to be no gene flow between populations. Now, gene flow, um, if you don't recall, gene flow is just the term we use that talks about how in individuals from one subpopulation migrate over to another and keep mixing the gene pools right through through mating. Um, you know, we, some we talked about speciation recently. One of the things is reproductive isolation. Well, what if those two groups still had mating going on back and forth? You're still keeping the gene pool as one. We call that gene flow. So in this Hardy-Weinberg condition, you'd have to there would have to be no gene flow going on between populations. The third standard that had to, would have to be true: every population would have to be extremely large, which also indicates a large amount of diversity and variation in the gene pool. The fourth condition is random mating. Uh, one of the things that we, the more you study animal behavior and you look at things in nature, mating is not a random act. However, for the Hardy-Weinberg conditions to be true and for populations to remain static and not evolving, ma mating must be completely and utterly random. Again, all of these are hypotheticals. These don't actually happen a lot in nature, especially all five at once. And then the fifth Right. There can be no natural selection happening. Right. There can't be any sort of differentiation or selecting for one trait over another. Because let's face it, that that's one of the prime mechanisms that does change allele frequency over time. So if all five of these conditions are said to be met, which, again, is not really something we, we, we witness in a natural population. But if, if we were to assume those all five to be true says under these conditions allele frequencies will remain constant and evolution will not occur but as i've mentioned several times most if not all natural populations do not exhibit these patterns or at least all five of those at once and that's an important thing that you have to understand yeah so uh and again so what we're gonna and mr leonard you know introduced all these really nicely here these kind of five points so what we're gonna do now is actually go through each of these and talk a little bit more in depth and uh, just kind of, but brief overviews because there is a lot to go over here, all right? Uh, so again, so then kind of the opposite of what Mr. Leonard just said, what causes evolution then? Uh, well, the opposite of that slide. So if there are mutations, if we do have gene flow, if we do have small populations, um, if there is non-random mating or if there is natural selection and, and Nature's choosing one trait over another because it has a higher fitness. So these are the five things that are going to cause populations to evolve. All right, and just remember, right? Uh, like we can't we can't say this enough that just if you have these present in a population and you have evolution happening, it's not going to happen in a generation. Right? It takes time for this to happen. So uh, as we go through these, all right, we're going to go. Some we might go a little faster than others. So if you have anything missing in your notes, there.
feel free to pause the video and jot some stuff down um, if you're writing just a little bit slower than how we're going over it. But so our first one then is mutations, all right? And they're the ultimate source of genetic variability, all right? We know we've already learned about it. We talked about it before evolution, right? And mutations when we change sequences in our DNA. And we think about, you know, the, the central dogma of biology, DNA to RNA to protein. Well, when we change that DNA, we're changing the RNA, which changes the protein. And, and we've said some mutations are good, some mutations are bad, okay? Uh, they're very rare when they happen. But because some are good, some are bad, they're not, I, I like this point down here, they're not goal-directed, okay? They provide potential for change. So it's kind of, it's kind of sheer luck, right? If something will work out beneficial to an organism and give it an adaptation or if it doesn't, all right? But it starts with the mutation here and the change in the DNA and how we get traits and pass them down. You want to talk about gene flow, Mr. Leonard? You got it. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, right, guys, gene flow, it's described as the act of keeping two separate gene pools as one essentially because there's migration between two populations which means typically there will be some sort of interbreeding assuming they're still of the same species and so as long as you have interbreeding between these two subgroups you're you're, you're keeping the gene pool as one so as such you're not getting that reproductive isolation that speciation would be dependent on but you're also if there's an allele that that appears in population A, the bluebirds on the left, as long as there's gene flow, the likelihood of that allele still being present in population B is very high. But if there wasn't gene flow, right? So you guys might remember allopatric speciation. Here's a mountain right, that's splitting this population. So if gene, flow, if gene flow was cut off, we now have two separate distinct gene pools that are going to be potentially evolving um, separately, right? Selection will be different um, on population A versus population B or what have you. But again, this Hardy-Weinberg principle, right? By, by maintaining gene flow, you're maintaining uh, a, a diverse single uh, gene pool. So that's what we mean by that. Nice. Did I leave anything out, Mr. Toto? No, I think that's a good one. Nice, nice and brief. So, our next point, right, is is these. Uh, you know, we said large populations are going to maintain that uh, equilibrium. So, small populations are going to be more subject to random changes in those allele frequency. And I kind of think of it as like the law of averages, right? If you were to average everybody out, you're going to kind of be somewhere in the middle of like a spectrum. But if you have a really small group of people, um, or not just people, but any organism, right? Uh, they might be really different, um, and you can have some some extremes to one side or the other of a larger population. So they're a lot more vulnerable to this. Um, and there's events, you know, that you have the chance that uh, certain events could reduce or eliminate certain alleles out of a population. And we kind of call this, right, the genetic drift, and, and two types we'll look at here are population bottleneck and the founder effect. Um, and, and this is a great example here, right, of genetic drift, where uh, variability, right, can get reduced in a population just because we have a small population. So we have these flowers here, and you have some that are red, some that are white. Let's say only five of them have offspring that can grow up and, and reproduce. Again, we have a small population here. And if only two of these guys were to survive because of, again, usually some kind of uh, extreme environmental circumstance, maybe a really bad drought, right, if we're talking about flowers. And you see both the homozygous dominant uh, plant, two of those were to survive. Well, now we have a population of entirely homozygous dominant, right? Red, red flowers here. So having a small population just by chance, if it works out right, can really limit those alleles that get passed on in several generations and really change that population. And uh, so go ahead, before, Mr. before you move on. I just want to also point out, if you guys look at the bottom of each figure, you'll see the allele frequencies for the dominant allele, which is what P represents, and the recessive allele, which is what uh, Q represents. And so when we talked about allele frequency earlier, 
you're seeing both the the mathematical way of detecting evolution happening, right? So 70% of the population was made up of the dominant red allele in generation one, whereas only 30% was. After one generation, it shifted to a 50-50 percentage, right? If you add up all the alleles, you'll have the same number of big red alleles as you would little little white alleles. And then by as little as the third generation, we've eliminated entirely the recessive allele. And we can see that mathematically at the bottom there. So I just want to reemphasize the allele frequency as, as a way of measuring and modeling evolution in action. And that's a cool thing, right? Is that it's not just, you know, us talking about it in class. We can actually do math and uh, measure it and, and see it, which is cool. Um, all right. So, yeah. And, and let's talk about these two specific cases. And they're, and they're kind of related. But we have what's called a population bottleneck is the first one. And we'll see pictures of these in the next two slides. And then we have the founder effect. So when we think about a bottleneck, okay, uh, maybe if you've ever seen a, a Coke bottle or any type of bottle with a liquid, right, it goes from really wide to really narrow at the neck there. Um, and, and what can happen, right, is that if we were to think of that as a population, if only a few of that big population can survive, right, and you have a small size, um, we can really change that allele frequency. And again, this usually happens from some kind of catastrophic event, right? Like an asteroid hits the earth or there's a severe, severe drought for years and years and years. Um, change of landscape, over hunting. It really reduces that genetic variability. Um, similar to that, right, is this thing called the founder effect. Uh, and this is the idea, it's a special case of, of bottleneck, right? But you have a new population founded, right, isolated colonies by a small number of organisms. So if some birds are getting lost during a migration or by a storm, right, they end up in a new spot and start to colonize that spot. Well, the rest of the population that comes after them is going to look like them because that allele frequency is going to be very, very small. So I'll talk about uh, bottleneck here and then Mr. Leonard can talk about founder effect. So again, here's the shape of the bottle that we've talked about. And uh, you can see there's three colors, right? We have yellow, and let's say the color is represented uh, alleles in a population. So maybe it's, you know, feather colors in a bird. And we had three types here. So we have a large population, and then all of a sudden something happens where most of these uh, die and don't reproduce. And we only have a few number that actually move on to the next generation. Again, a fire, a flood, an asteroid. And if you notice, some blue or green, whatever color that is, and yellow balls are moving in here, but none of the red ones make it out. So the surviving individuals have a much uh, shallower gene pool, right? The allele frequency, you just have blue and yellow. So in future generations, we don't see that red allele present. So it's kind of that bottleneck where it gets rid of most of the population and you're stuck with whatever genes of whoever survived. So in the founder effect, uh, it, it, it's it's a it's another case of that same phenomenon where only a relative few members of a larger, more diverse, genetically diverse population start a new population somewhere else, right? They they sort of quote unquote found this new population, right? The the, the founding fathers, if you will, of this new population. So this is just a very simple model showing a bunch of uh, ladybugs, and you see a little bit of variety in color, uh, in this case only two colors, but what if a small number of only the red ones got blown off to an island and they colonized that island and they weren't able to get back off, right? So they start a new population there, but none of the yellow alleles exist now in that gene pool. So the real big takeaway here is whether you're talking about founder effects whether you're talking about population bottleneck or just genetic drift as a whole, right? These are both special cases of genetic drift. The consequence, like the, the, the population in terms of number of individuals might explode and get really high. It might even reach the, the, the sheer numbers of the original population. But what's key here is the amount of genetic variation is decreasing in every scenario because you're not getting all of the representative alleles from the original population surviving or making it to the new location. So that gene pool just lacks that allele or those alleles. And you can't 
as we know, we can't just make evolution is not goal oriented. We can't make new alleles. It has to be a random mutation and it just happens to have to be the lucky right adaptation. So you can't just count on that. So in almost every case of the founder effect, bottleneck effect or genetic drift, we're reducing genetic variation. Yeah. And I think kind of just to tie this whole conversation we've had about genetic drift up, um, right, is that one thing is for certain that uh, it's another example beyond just natural selection of, of how those alleles, right, the genetics can change over time via a different mechanism. And we, we kind of like this analogy, if you've ever seen like gears in an engine or a clock, right, all these little gears spin together to make this big wheel turn, all right? So think about the big wheel of evolution and we see species changing over long generations of time. Well, what uh, what allows for that evolution? It's not just one thing. And again, if we think about the five parts of the Heidi Hardy Weinberg principle, right? They all kind of work together. So some of it's genetic drift, some of it's natural selection, uh, having adaptation, some of it is gene flow, some of it might be sexual selection, and all the other things we've talked about today kind of work together uh, to kind of power this evolution. And like Mr. Leonard said it's not goal oriented. So it's not like they're working for a specific thing. Uh, it just, or, or type of organism, right? It just so happens that it's the, it's all chance things work out the way they are and the environmental pressures there to make us get to this goal of evolution. Right. And the last thing I would just add to that, um, is that these are not mutually exclusive. You can have multiple mechanisms occurring simultaneously. So when we talk about genetic drift, like the founder effect, where some of those beetles made their way to an island, but what's happening now is natural selection is active upon those individuals on that new island. Um, and if that population diverges in the future, well, maybe you'll have two subpopulations and there'll be gene flow between them, right? So just understand that it's not one or the other. It's usually a combination of all these factors happening at once. Okay, uh, the, the fourth bullet on the Hardy-Weinberg list of things that uh, actually cause evolution, right? This is the opposite of what Hardy-Weinberg proposed, um, you know, their hypothetical scenario was that all mating need to be random if allele frequencies are to stay the same. Well, one of the things we know about many years of nature documentaries and scientists and evolutionary biologists in the field is that um, mating in the wild is anything but random. Uh, and there's a term that we like to use. It's usually called sexual selection, just like natural selection. Nature favors some phenotypes over others. Well, when it comes to the choosy mates, uh, which in a lot of different species tends to be the female. It's not always, but it tends to be. So the female has to choose what she instinctively feels are the most um, beneficial phenotypical traits that the male kind of presents to her and shows off. So I know a lot of you guys, we watched the little bird of paradise video not too long ago. And we saw a scene where this, this male bird here, who's putting on a little show and dance is trying to uh, show off and attract this female. And if you remember from that video clip, the female flies away. So he strikes out. So what she must, must be, you know, unconsciously thinking is, that this male is not expressing phenotypically the best of the best. And so since females are choosy, they tend to, right, uh, choose those that display the best, have the best dance, sing the best songs, whatever, uh, whatever those behaviors tend to be. So as such, since it's not random, there's an unequal distribution of alleles that make it to the next generation. If the females are only choosing the best of the best, then it's those alleles that are getting passed on more frequently. And so that does in fact change allele frequencies in the population, which is a sign that that population is slowly evolved. Yeah. And I, and I think it's important to remember too, is not just with birds, but with this happens with all birds are a great example because they have all these crazy sexual adaptations. Right. But with all organisms, I mean, think about like deer that live near us, right? The biggest buck is going to, you know, 
the, the female does will want to reproduce with them. All these crazy adaptations we see, whether it's crazy feathers, big antlers, to be able to grow those crazy feathers and do dances and have big antlers and have a big coat or whatever it is, you got to be pretty healthy and have good genes to begin with. And that's kind of what that female is choosing too. You know, they she knows that if you have the best dance, you'll probably give her the best genes, which means her offspring will have a good chance at surviving. Cool. So, and kind of that brings us right into our last point there in the Hardy Weinberg principle uh, is natural selection. And there's a lot of words on this slide, but you guys have learned all these already because we've already talked about natural selection. So we're going to do a quick recap on natural selection as an overview, but then kind of go into three ways of how it happens, which maybe we didn't talk about yet, right? But uh, natural selection does not cause the genetic changes in the individuals, okay? That's the mutation that's going to cause genetic change. However, natural selection will affect how those genes are passed on, if they're advantageous or if they're not. And while it acts on the individual, right, an individual bird will reproduce or won't, it will survive or it will die, uh, it affects the whole, or evolution occurs at the whole population, even though it's affecting an individual. And uh, you've probably heard that word before, fitness, right? Reproductive success, how well can you survive and how well can you reproduce um, is going to give you a higher fitness. And again, we've said this many times, but those evolutionary changes through natural selection, they're not good or progressive. Uh, it just so happens to fit whatever that environment is selecting for right then. What's Who's got the best adaptation? Uh, and we see environments change. And we've talked about, and we will actually talk about more uh, extinction, right? If you can't keep up with those changes. So, and again, how does it work here? Uh, you know, we, we've talked about the survival of the reef of the fittest. It's all about reproduction for organisms to live on. They need to pass on those genes to the offspring. Um, and a natural selection is an issue of differential reproduction. So those with certain alleles will leave more offspring than others with different alleles. This whole idea of, of surviving, reproducing, passing on your genes, all right? Phenotypes and genotypes. If, you, if natural selection acts on a phenotype, that will reflect the underlying genotype because that's what determines the phenotype. So uh, that was a real quick review of natural selection, but we've talked about it already. But now we kind of got to get into the last bit of this lesson, which is how natural selection influences the populations. And there's three ways here, which we're, we're going to talk about. The first is directional selection, uh, then stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. So, Mr. Leonard, why don't you talk about directional selection? Sure. So in, in all three of these examples, right, you're going to see a little graph, and it's you guys should recognize the bell curve graph. It's a normal distribution, right? So for any phenotype, right? We're looking at phenotypes that have a range of phenotypes, like height in, in humans, right? If we took our classes individually and lined us all up and measured the height of everyone, we would fit something like this. And the larger the sample size, the more it kind of has this bell shaped curve. So we're, for all these examples, we're looking at Phenotypes that have a range, it's not just one or the other, right? It's not just purple or white flowers like in Mendel's pea plants, right? This is a range of beak sizes, a range of heights, a range of skin colors or uh, whatever, right? You pick the trait. Um, and, and so that's what we're looking at here to start. So what is directional selection? So the dotted line represents the previous population, like a snapshot of that population. So the peak of the graph represents the, the, the majority of the population. If the y-axis is number of individuals in the population and the x-axis is the range of phenotypes from small to large or, or whatever, from, from you know, narrow to wide, if it's a beak or, or what have you, uh, that would be on the x-axis. So the range of phenotypes is on the x. So that means the largest percent of your population is whatever that mean or average phenotype is, right? It's not too small. It's not too big. It's that sweet spot right in the middle. And that, that's the same, you know, we can just look at human populations as an example of a lot of these, right? You know, the, the average height is the average height because the majority of the population kind of hovers around that similar height. And there are less individuals that are extremely tall or that are extremely short. So, but to explain this type of selection where the overall average shifts towards one extreme, 
Okay. So the way we would interpret this is if this was, it's, let's say that this was beak size. It goes from, from a small beak to a large beak. If we were looking at that example, like in Darwin's finches, if this was how evolution was happening on one of those islands in the Galapagos, maybe the, the, the food source started to dwindle. And really the only thing that was available in a large amount uh, to provide them with the nutrients that they need was something that you needed a large beak to, to, to open up. Think of like hard, tough seeds or something like that. So what would happen is that if you, in the old population, only the few members in the, that had the really large beaks would have that capability to crack open those hard seeds. So again, going with our idea of natural selection, those are, that's a favorable characteristic. They're eating more frequently. That allows them to survive long enough to reproduce more frequently, passing on the big beak genes more frequently to the next generation. So over enough generations, over enough time, when you, that pattern is sort of in play, the whole average beak size is going to shift in that one direction, right? That's, it's, it's directional selection. It's, it's moving towards one extreme. Now, the opposite, I just want to say that the opposite could have been just as true. It, it depends on the environment, depends on the scenario, but maybe small beaks could have been selected for it. Then you would see the new peak, right, move to the left as opposed to the right. But it's just showing you the, the overall average is shifting in one direction towards one of the extremes. Next. Yep. So, and then, so this kind of goes back to what Mr. Leonard was saying at the beginning there to, after, when talking about directional selection is stabilizing selection. Okay. And directional selection really can't go on forever, right? Because we, again, we said there's kind of an average in the middle of that population. Um, and again, hope that environment will, will bring it back here. So this selects a, against both extremes, right? Um, if we think about the, you know, the big beaks versus small beak, eventually that population is going to come back towards the middle. Um, and, and uh, you know, some examples here would be like these, I can never say the word, but these types of lizards, right? Um, a smaller lizard is going to have a hard time defending territories, okay? But the bigger ones are going to be much easier to spot as prey. So it's not necessarily advantageous to be on either side of the bell curve, but somewhere in the middle is going to be advantageous. And again, if we see those uh, popular or the environment start to change one way or another, that could shift it back to that directional selection. Uh, and our term for this is, is balanced polymorphism, right? Two or more alleles maintained because each is favored by separate environmental forces. So an example of that, right, in uh, humans would be uh, with our red blood cells, okay? And we can look at our three genotypes here. So we can think about it, the homozygous dominant, uh, which is susceptible to malaria. The homozygous recessive, right? It's resistant to malaria, a disease carried by mosquitoes, um, but it's fatal with sickle cell disease. And sickle cell, if you haven't heard about it, it's basically when your red blood cells start to turn into these funky shapes and really don't work well. Um, so however, the kind of the medium, the middle, the heterozygous, they're resistant to malaria, but they may have sickle cell disease. So this kind of shows that kind of the middle is the best spot to be, right? Uh, you're resistant to malaria. You may have this disease, so some of you may not make it, but overall, right, you're, you're somewhere in the middle. And that's called ba balanced polymorphism. Anything to add there, Mr. Leonard? No, I think you got pretty good. Sweet. Now, I, I, maybe I'll just add, even though one or the other is not desired, right? You don't want to get malaria and you certainly don't want to have sickle cell disease. But the reason that this is selected for the heterozygous is it's better to have a minor affliction of both and have protection a little bit from both as opposed to to be all in one basket and then susceptible completely to the other force at play. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, this comes up every year as students wonder why you can still have sickle cell, right, as a heterozygous, and that's a good thing. It, well, it's not necessarily a good thing. It's it's the, just the way that natural selection, remember, selection is not goal-oriented. It's just selecting. It's it, it tends to better be better to have protection against both. So the way that individuals have that is by being heterozygous. So yeah. I would just add that. Cool.
And then the final example of uh, the direction that selection. So think of this as the opposite of the last example, uh, which was stabilizing selection, right? Where you're stabilizing the mean. You're, you're, you're basically, the environment is stable. More individuals are sort of settling into, you know, becoming more fit to their surroundings. Well, sometimes the opposite is true, where now, especially if there's some sort of dramatic shift in the environment, where there's selection against the mean, you know, being the average is no longer beneficial. Um, so it's, it's in, in, in some cases, it's better to have one extreme or the other. And so you kind of get this camel hump looking uh, outcome of the graph over time. If that's the case so we're selecting against the mean and selecting for either extreme so this might be due to the environment uh you know providing only a few specific types of resources that are necessary for survival um there are these black-bellied sea cracker birds and in their population, they, they kind of have like one of two extreme varieties, like a really large or really small beak. And it turns out that there are hardly any like mid-sized beaks. It's really kind of really large beaks or really small beaks. And the question is, why is that? Well, based on the seeds that are available, they're either soft seed varieties in some of the, 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 the plant life there, or there are very hard seeds. And so the really hard seeds you can only really get at if you have the strong, large beak to crush them. A medium-sized beak might lose out on those competitive situations. But also on the other end, having the small, more you know, nimble beak to get the smaller, softer seeds, again, they have an advantage over the medium-sized, large-sized beaks for that end of the spectrum. So you kind of get caught in the middle, right? If you're average, you're, you're being out-competed for the large, hard, tough seeds in this direction. But I'm also being outcompeted for the small soft seeds in that direction because they have the favorable adaptation. So over time, that old mean starts to shrink, and you get to see the, a rise in a dual rise in the extreme phenotypes, really small, really large. In that example, yeah. So guys, those are our three uh, kind of ways of selection that we talked about. And again, that, let's wrap it all up here, right? That natural selection was our fifth uh, cause of of the Hardy Weinberg principle there and how we see evolution happen. So, and again, just to wrap it up, we've probably, we've talked about this, right? But natural selection and Mr. Leonard just actually touched on it. Right? It could happen for a variety of reasons. Um, and it all comes down to those, again, adaptations, a word, you know, right? A characteristic that helps an organism survive and reproduce. And it's not only just physical factors. It could be with other organisms in a little bit here. Uh, We'll, when we get into ecology in our next couple of lessons, we'll start talking about biotic and abiotic factors, right? Um, but they both affect organisms and how well they are adapted to that environment, okay? So it might be, uh, you know, the non-living environment where it's, you know, the bottom line to have food, water, shelter. Um, but then you have those uh, biotic factors that affect natural selection, whether it's competition um, with other species or competition within a species or predators co-evolution, symbio symbiosis, again, sexual selection we talked about, altruism, right, helping others and, and whatnot. So there's many other biotic and abiotic factors that can affect evolution. Mr. Leonard, anything to add to um, wrap up here? Uh, no, I think we've taken enough of their time, Mr. Toto. That sounded good to me. Yeah, so guys, go back. If you have anything missing in your notes, go back through and uh, – Fill that in, and then there'll be a, just a little uh, kind of wrap-up summarizing assessment here that you'll do separately for all this stuff. So again, a lot of a lot of terms in this video, a lot of concepts, but really the last big push here to wrap up evolution. So uh, thanks for watching. Shoot your email if you or shoot your teachers an email if you have any questions, and we'll see you in class.